Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Each week, we address issues of timely and timeless concern with newsmakers and the journalists who report on them, with artists, writers, scientists, educators, social scientists, government leaders. We speak with each one to one. I'm delighted to welcome the writer Rana Reiko Rizzuto to the program today. Her first novel, Why She Left Us, won an American Book Award in 2000. On the faculty of Goddard College, she works with students in the creative writing program. And this year, she was one of the nominees for the National Book Critics Circle Award for her most recent book, Hiroshima in the Morning. It's just been published by the Feminist Press, which is housed here at the City University Graduate Center. Welcome. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Your bio describes you as half Japanese. Mm -hmm. who, are your, who are your parents? My mother. My mother was Japanese American, and my father is Italian Irish. Your father was? Italian Irish. Oh, Italian Virginia. Irish. Yeah. And you were born in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And some of your relatives were interned during yes. World War II. Was it your, your grandparents? My, was it? my mother was interned. She was a month old right before they, they took the family. And all, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, all of, all of her side of the family. You write that they never talked about being interned. Why, and, and how did you finally found, find out about it? Well, you know, I think, I think it was shameful. I think they also um, had been given a strong message that they had to be sort of hyper-American. So when they got out of the camps, they moved to Hawaii, and they, they really put it all behind them. We didn't really have any pictures. Um, and it wasn't until the reparations that my mother really understood that she was interned because she, she was four or five when she left the camps. Oh, okay. So okay. she had put that behind her. Your husband, Brian, was your childhood sweetheart? Yes, we met when, when I was 17. In, Ho in Hawaii? In Hawaii, yeah. Okay, and you married very early. Um, well, we I actually were together for a while. We married when I was 25. Okay, okay. So you, did you marry in, in, in high school? Did you meet in high school? or? We, he, he was a year older than I was, so he had just graduated, and he was off to college. Okay. And, yeah. Now, you went to Columbia mm -hmm. and majored in astrophysics, of all things. Mm -hmm. How do you go from astrophysics to writing? My, my mother was a writer, my father is a writer, um, and I just, I always knew how to write, and I thought, well, I'd like to do something different. And there were, um, there's a whole observatory in the top of Mauna Kea on the island that, uh, where I grew up, and I thought, well, I'll try that instead. Mm -hmm. and, and then, um, it was really interesting, I, I really liked it, but I didn't want to go off to do a graduate degree in it, and so I went back to writing. Okay. Now, your first book, Why She Left Us, a novel, mm -hmm was about a Japanese-American woman who abandoned her illegitimate child during World War II. Um, was that based on people you knew, you knew or was it totally? I, I picked up most of the stories from that book from interviews. I did about 30 or 40 interviews. Okay. And one of the interesting things was that in this, in this gap between going into the internment camp and, and getting out, lots of people changed their... Um, their stories, basically, that there were lots of things that happened in their lives that they would rather not talk about, and um, they put them behind mm -hmm. them. And that was really interesting to me. That book led to the grant that took you to Hiroshima, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So you go to Hiroshima in 2001, intending to get information to write another novel. Mm -hmm. um, why a novel about Hiroshima? Well, one of the people that I interviewed when I was um, finishing up why she left us was a great aunt of mine and she had been interned in the Jerome camp and when she was let out she joined the American occupation and she went to Japan mm -hmm. and so she was one of the first Americans who came into Hiroshima um, after it was bombed she was working with the atomic bomb casualty commission at that time and she had all these stories that um, I had never heard of you know I didn't I didn't study the Japanese American internment and I didn't I didn't really study Hiroshima and the, and the effects of the bomb so it was all brand new to me. Mm -hmm. Was this your first trip to Japan? It was. It was. It was my, one of my very first trips out of the country. Now you seem to be unprepared for what you, for what and who you encountered. Yeah, I, I guess, you know, for starters, I thought, oh, I'm going away for six months, and I didn't, didn't know um, even what that was going to be about, to live by myself for six months. Um, and, and at first I thought, well, I'll just go and ask people, and they'll tell me their stories. I was looking for, um, like, the textures and the, the, the feelings of what it was like to live through this war. And I was able to speak to some people, but they were telling a story that was very 
um, very rehearsed at that point. And um, so it, it's I've sort of... they've told it so many times. They had. They had told it so many times. And I also think that they were telling it for a specific reason. They were telling it to heal themselves, and they were telling it um, to... to be, they, well, they're peace activists, so you know they, they had a, a particular message, and they, it wasn't what I what I was really looking for. So the first three months was quite a struggle. Well, did you despair? Did you at any time did you despair? <laughs> I, I getting despaired enough? a lot. I despaired. <laughs> about, about, In the beginning, getting enough I, I couldn't I couldn't even get a, an apartment. You know, I, it was because because in Japan, unless you have a sponsor, uh -huh. if you're if you're a foreigner, you can't get an apartment. Okay. And I couldn't find a sponsor, and so I was living out of hotels, and I was dragging my big bags from this place to that place, and and not getting anything. And yes, I I did a lot. And you weren't fluent in Japanese. No, I was not. And they weren't talking to you, really. They weren't, <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? And they kept saying, well, maybe when you're ready, or well, it's awfully hot right now, or what, whatever it was. It was, um, and then this, this wonderful woman who's still a dear friend, and I, I heard from her yesterday, actually, um, kind of took me under her wing and got me a place and, and started me off. And then, um, then I really saw the inside of Japan. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, and how, did you, how did you hook up with her? Was she somebody... She was um, she was a f kind of a friend of a friend of a friend, okay. and actually um, in that line, I was actually never supposed to meet her. I was supposed to meet another gentleman who suddenly had some health problems, and he called her up and said, "You know, pick her up at the train station." Mm -hmm. So, so then nine eleven happened, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, the hibaksha, mm -hmm. the survivors, mm -hmm. um, suddenly started opening up to you. Um, why, did, why do you think 9-11 made them start talking about themselves in a different way? You know, it was, it was I mean, for people here in New York, obviously, they, they felt how devastating it was. But it was devastating for everyone all over the world. And um, I mean, we, were, we were in shock. We were watching. And, and, we, and everyone suddenly felt very unsafe. And I think that when the Hibakusha were telling their stories, it was to create a safety. And it was to, to believe that, that, you know, nothing terrible could ever happen again. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and it, it did, basically. We were very unsafe. And it, um, it sort of dropped the barrier between um, the things that they had put away and resolved. And, um, and they started to come out. So they would remember um, losing their parents, losing their children, finding their mother's bones. Um, cremating their their mothers. There was one person who um, was six at the time and cremated his mother, um, and these things just started coming out. Now you were surprised not to find a whole lot of hostility towards the United States, mm -hmm. which I, I find surprising. I was I was kind of <laughs> a little bit hostile myself, you know, because I thought, wow, this thing happened and I didn't know about it, and and um, and. You know how could this be? And I. Um, so you felt hostility towards the United States. Well, you know, I mean, I wouldn't go that far, but but yeah, it was kind of like, how how does this happen? I mean, you know, I'm I'm an American, and and I've I have traveled around the world now, and I know what a privilege it is to be an American, especially an American woman in many in many countries. But there are also things like the internment, like Hiroshima, that you kind of, it's complicated. You have right. to kind of wrap your head around it, right. and. Um, and I, it was interesting that they, there's, a, there's more of a sense of anti-war, that war is bad, that they participated in, in a lot of you know, devastation and cruelty, and, and that it's just war, in fact, that's bad. It's not, it's not really us versus them mm -hmm. at this point. You, you wrote that the, um, the survivors were trying to make peace, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, that, and perhaps that the act of making peace required them not to harbor mm -hmm. feelings of ill will towards mm -hmm. Americans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think that's true. I mean, I think I think you, we see it all the time. If there isn't us versus them, then there there are always these distinctions, and and there's only so far you can get. Do you think that that's one of the reasons? I mean, you you, you said one of the reasons the members of your family didn't talk about the uh, the internment camps was was shame. Mm -hmm. But do you think also one of the reasons and 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 the they felt this pressure to be patriotic mm -hmm, as well. But mm -hmm. do you also think that it was because they were trying to make peace as well? Or was it different? I don't know. I, that, it's, it's quite possible. I do think, I do think that when you, you carry something around, you're only poisoning yourself with it. So I do think that you do have to let it go so you can move on. So who 
were some of the, I mean, you met, you interviewed a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, who were some of the ones who impressed you most or made an impression on you? Well, I, I did meet a lot of people, and I, you know, I met some, some people who were very angry, and I met some people who wanted me to tell their story and not, not the story that I came for. But I think um, after September 11th, I talked to a lot of people who had lost their children. And this one couple in particular had, um, had lost their two boys, and they were exactly a year older than my two boys. Mm -hmm. And um, the mother felt terribly guilty because she had gone to, to work that day and left her children behind. And um, it just, it's, it's devastating to, to see how fresh that is. And then to think about, well, what if that, what if that happened to me? What if that happened to my, my children? What, how do you survive that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What did talking to the survivors teach you about war? And what did it teach you about peace, do you think? Hmm. You know, I, it, it's, I think that what I learned for myself is that you don't really, you can't really experience war in large groups and from a distance. It's really this thing that happens to individuals. And um, I mean, it's, it's devastating. And, and I think that, I think that we might be more peaceful as a people if we understood on, on that very individual level what, um, what it's like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're going to take a short break. Then I'll be back with more with Rana Reiko Rizzuto, author of Hiroshima in the Morning, published by the Feminist Press. Yes. That's it. to be perfect to be a perfect parent. When you adopt a child from foster care, just being there makes all the difference. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking with Rana Rico Rizzuto, author of Hiroshima in the Morning. It's published by the Feminist Press and was a National Book Critic Circle Award nominee for 2011. I ask you um, what you learned from your, from the survivors about war. Did you, what did you learn about peace? Well, I think um, one of the things that I saw when September 11th happened was that this, the survivors were very much against um, retaliation. They felt like the uh, against our retaliating against right. anyone. Okay, and and actually, interestingly, um, the time that that we talked, you asked me earlier about um, their anger toward the United States. The only time that I really saw that come out was um, when the United States started bombing Afghanistan. Okay, and that was really interesting because their sense was that they had been a devastated people. They didn't have any food. They didn't have any, any water. They didn't have any infrastructure. Um, they were starving and we had bombed them. And they saw, they saw Afghanistan in that same way. So, um, so that was, that was really interesting. They felt that, uh, there were different ways to, to go about creating safety. Mm -hmm. Now I know you talked about the peace part. Mm -hmm. Um, have the Japanese enshrined uh, what happened in Hiroshima in the same way that uh, the European countries have enshrined what happened to the Jews in, you know, the concentration camps, all of that in Europe? Have they, is there a lot of evidence of it or is it constant, are you constantly reminded of it? Well, you know, in Hiroshima, interestingly, because the entire place was flattened, That's true. There, there's what they call the Genbaku Dome, it's the atomic bomb dome and you see that, but otherwise you, you see almost nothing. Um, they do, they, they have an incredible museum and they do make a point of bringing school kids through it all the time and there, there really do, is a kind of a, a never forget um, message. But, but at the same time, after September 11th, I was sitting in a park and we were with a friend of mine who's a translator and we were asking people, what well, do you think about war? And they were like, well, not really. That we don't think about right. it a lot. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, interesting. 
While in Hiroshima, you found yourself in the midst of your own real life drama mm -hmm. involving your husband and your two sons. Now your husband had actually encouraged you mm -hmm. to take the fellowship. Mm -hmm. And then he seemed to, after you'd been away for a while, and he was, he was also the mm -hmm. one who had said, um, you were hesitant about having children. Mm -hmm. He wanted them. Mm -hmm. He said, okay, have them and I'll be the primary caretaker. Right, right. But he seemed to, once you were away for a while, he seemed to resent your being away. Mm -hmm. um, did you ever feel that he had deceived you about his true feelings? <laughs> you know, I think, I think we were both really naive. I mean, I don't think that we had any idea how hard it is to, to raise children. Mm -hmm. and, and so when I went away, he thought, oh, I can do this. And then, and then it was harder than he thought. And, and um, so I don't think it was a deliberate deception. Um, but, but it definitely wasn't what we thought it would be. And we had been together as a unit. I had been very much the, the caretaker in our home and, and for the first five years of my kids' lives, the primary caretaker for them. And, uh, and then all of a sudden we split. And I think being kind of half a person was shocking to both of us. Did your son, your sons did not seem to have difficulty with your temporary absence, or did they? Well, I think, you know, I, they didn't seem to. Um, it, it's very hard to get a three-year-old and a five-year-old to talk to you on the phone. Um, but there certainly were times, I think, when they, they were very sad and they were very much looking forward to, to coming to Japan when they spent three months or two months with me in Japan and, and just loved it. Um, I, think, I think they were pretty resilient. Okay. So they come to Japan. Your children are having a great time. Mm -hmm. But your, the issues in your marriage seem to have come to a head right. with, with your husband while you were there. Right, right. I mean, I think, I think he was feeling sad. I think he was feeling like he wanted this to be over. That's one of the things that, that uh, came up a lot, that he wanted everything to go back the way it was. And I, um, I had a whole new idea of, of the world and myself in it and what I wanted to do with, with my time. And I wanted... I wanted to kind of reconfigure my life a little bit so that, um, so that I would pay more attention to, to doing my work and being a writer um, and be in the family. And it, it wasn't, it, ultimately it wasn't gonna happen. And, and you did not want it to go back to being the way it not, was? No, not exactly. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, another issue that you weave into the book seemed to be you were trying to resolve issues with your mother mm -hmm. who was in the early stages, was it Alzheimer's? Yes, okay. Yes. She Tell me about early her. onset Alzheimer's for 13 years, and you know she was a perfect, perfect mother. She she um, took care of three little children, and um, and she was always there for us. And she was also always there for my friends and and the community. And she was the person who was bringing everybody who didn't have a place to go for Thanksgiving to to the home. And I couldn't. I knew I couldn't be her. Right. And yet she was the only model that I had. And so for me it was kind of an all or nothing thing. If I can't be her, then, um, then I can't be a mother. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and of course, it, you know, by the time I did have children, I couldn't go back to her and ask her what it was like to be, be a woman as well as a mother. Because she was no longer there in that right. way. Right. Um, you write that memory is not history. Uh, Instead, it's what we choose to remember. Mm -hmm. uh, is it how we choose to write our history? Is that what? I think so, and I think we're always we're always rewriting it, depending on where we are and what we want to believe about ourselves and what we want to um, believe about other people and our and our roles in the world. And I saw that very strongly in myself. I saw that in in the Hibaksha and their stories and how they changed um, from this this story of great resilience to this story of terrible sadness. I also feel like I saw that a little bit in what was going on in the world after September 11th, that idea of, you know, um, the good guys and the bad guys and, and, and um, the divisions that we use um, to explain what we're doing. Now, there was one Habaksha in particular that you were looking forward to, to meeting, Lily. Mm -hmm. Tell me about her. Well, she was a woman who was in the internment camps, and she was... Um, she was sent back to Japan. She got there just after the atomic bombing. But um, now, she, we, she when I say sent, back, she was deported or, or what? She was she was deported. She was repatriated. She was an American, 
Uh, but she she married somebody who was considered to be a troublemaker, okay. and so they decided that they were going to ship them back, even though she was a citizen. She didn't want to go. Her she had children. Um, they were citizens as well. But um, but at, at that time they just you know they could do that. So they sent two ships of people back uh, back to Japan, and I was really interested in in her story. Mm -hmm. um. Did the interviews that you did with the survivors help shape your memory, your history? Interesting question. I, I don't think that I have thought that much about mm -hmm. like how it, I mean, I've, I've thought about myself and, and how my, my own personal story has changed. I think that the interviews gave me um, a real sense of responsibility because after September 11th, people came to me um, wanting to give me their stories, you know, from before of saying, oh, it was too hot to talk to me. Right. Um, and they, they wanted me to be kind of a, a repository of the people in their lives that they lost. So they would tell me about their sisters, their mothers, and, and not just what happened to them when the bomb was dropped, but who they were before the bomb was right. dropped. And, and I think that's an enormous responsibility. Um, and so that's definitely one of the things that, that made me feel that I needed to write this book. So you wound up not writing the Hiroshima novel. Mm -hmm. Is it something that you still want to write or think you might I actually write? just finished. Really? Yes, I just finished it in the end of February. Um, and it's actually a book that, that uh, combines the, the story of the Hiroshima woman and her twin daughters who very ironically, um, grow up in Hawaii and, and are in a town where two tsunamis hit that little tiny town. Okay. So it's kind of like a, a, a Hiroshima tsunami <laughs> mix, and that's just been finished. And now we've got an earthquake. Yeah, we have an earthquake Is and a that, tsunami. And what do you want to say about that? Is that might that possibly be um, material for a, a, a book about that? I, I don't know, but I know that that you know, I've been talking to my friends in Japan, and they the devastation is amazing. And for the for the Habaksha, you know, they're watching the the nuclear reactor situation right. unfold. Right. And um, you know, I, it's it. I'm sure that it's bringing up quite a bit for them. We've got a minute left. Um, the 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 trip, that whole experience, changed your marriage and your relationship mm -hmm. with your husband. Mm -hmm. So are, are you divorced now or are you? We, we are divorced. It took us about seven years to get divorced. I, um, uh, my children live with my, my, with their dad and uh, they see me. I'm the kind of the non-custodial but um, half time. You live nearby? Mother. I okay. live nearby. They, they come over after school and, and we have a really, a really interesting good relationship. I mean he has been very supportive, you know, in a divorce situation to make sure that I can be the kind of mother that I want to be, and uh, and and it's it's been really good. I spend a lot of time with my kids, and I spend a lot of time with their schools. Mm -hmm. And I was recently at the school for um, a peace conference. I was talking about the Japanese American internment, and the the guidance counselor sit there told me that we were the best divorced co-parents she had ever met in her there life. Go. So there you go. <laughs> well, it's a very, I Thank call you. it a strange and lovely book. Thank you. And we can look forward to your, to reading the novel yes. that you went there to yes. write and will be coming out yes. hopefully soon. Yes. I want to thank Rana Reka Rizzuto for joining me today. Hiroshima in the Morning has been published by the Feminist Press for the City University of New York and One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy.